right? All right. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the second edition of Best Countries to Create a Company. Uh, we are thrilled to have Patrick O'Malley as a keynote speaker today. Uh, Patrick will give a product management career workshop. So if you're looking to start a product-based company or you have a product in your hands and you would like to improve how you how you develop and how you market it, this is the right uh, this is the right talk to listen. After Patrick's talk, we will have Paul Stavrum presenting the conditions and advantages for creating a company in Norway. Just on Patrick, a few words. Uh, Patrick is a product manager with 20 years of experience in building and managing products. Uh, he has worked for dozens of organizations, startups, and also large companies, and he was ex-VP of product at The Zone. Patrick is also co-founder and head of product at Lounge, which is the platform that powers the DG Nomads network. Patrick, the floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, pleasure to be here. And um, it's always nice to talk about uh, product management. Um, I work as a digital nomad, um, I'm going to share my screen now and bring up my talk. Um, you can tell me if you see it okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I do my product management from my uh, my home. So uh, it is relevant in a nomad context. Um, and of course, that's really good as well, because if you have a startup or a company and you need to find people to work on your product, um, you now have access to a global workforce, people who are uh, all over the world, although many of them are in Fuerteventura, but all over the world. And um, it's, uh, it's a great career to be in. It's a great role to have. It's not the easiest role to have. It's very challenging, but it is a, uh, it is a job that is, um, one in which you're constantly learning, one in which you are up against uh, huge challenges um, and you're working typically in a team solving complex problems, often problems that have never been solved before. Um, I will just say one thing uh, to kick off um, the kind of product management, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Persona, because a lot of people think that if you're going to be a good product manager, you're going to be like Steve Jobs. You're going to have a vision. You're going to come up with really good ideas. You're going to, you know, be relentlessly demanding. And um, those things can be true, but most of what product management is about is working with people. And if you can work with people to build a consensus, everyone in the team agrees this is a good way forward. Um, generally, um, you're not doing a bad job and uh, coming in and ranting and raving at everyone and being Steve Jobs like will set you back a step or two. So a large part of the job is around communication, teamwork, analyzing data, um, being a scientist, validating hypotheses, um, checking metrics, talking to customers, um, doing a lot of research, being technically proficient, um, being pretty good at marketing as well. Uh, there's, there's so many aspects to it, but, um, the place I wanted to start today, because this is, um, I believe going to be addressing an audience today that may not be product managers and may be thinking to themselves, how do I become a product manager? How do I get into that job? How do I do that role? So. I'm going to go on a bit of an allegorical adventure, meaning I'm going to tell a story and, um, and then I'll bring it back together and I will kind of tie it into what that means for you and how you can become a product manager. So, um, yeah, so where do product managers come from? This is an interesting topic. Um, if you look at me, I worked at many different companies, um, before. I moved to London in 2000 and I don't know, six, maybe for a company at Move Me called Move Me and then went on to work at Yahoo Answers. And since then I've worked on maybe 20 other companies, um, including The Zone, Loungey. I could name lots of them, but I, I kind of, this is the early part of my career. And um, 
what's interesting is I didn't do a degree in product management. Um, if you are going to be an architect, you probably do go to college and study architecture. If you're going to be uh, a doctor, you probably go to school to study medicine. I mean, almost certainly, hopefully. <laughs> Um, if you're going to become a dentist, similarly, you go and study dentistry. If you're going to become um, a marketer, if you're 15 years old and you want to become a digital marketer, um, there, is a, there is a marketing degree you can do. And you may decide that you want to go your own way and build skills up yourself. But there is kind of a formal established route. And that doesn't exist for product management. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that it's basically too new of a discipline for third party institutions to have developed a syllabus and curriculum for. It's ever changing and it's starting to happen. But what happened to me was I basically started off um, working as, I suppose, an entrepreneur, um, worked doing some web development and then became a, pro a project manager and moved from project management into product management, which is very, there is overlap, but it's a very different job. So I went not through college into being a product manager. I went through being a product, a project manager into being a product manager. So anyway, this is a story I want to tell you. And it goes a bit like this. So um, when I give this talk in person, I said, who recognizes this man? And of course, nobody does because because who is he? Nobody knows. But this is Frederick, Frederick Tutor, and he was the ice king. He made a, a fortune shipping and selling ice um, in the early 17th century. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen this. One of the Batman movies has a, has a scene like this where they're cutting ice. Um, but basically, you would take your boat and you would go to the Arctic and um, you would uh, cut blocks of ice with these tools out of lakes. And um, then uh, you'd ship it back to London or New York or wherever. And um, then serving ice from Wenham Lake was like the most exclusive thing you could do at your dinner party, um, which is very interesting, I think. I mean, that's a, a kind of, we just don't even think about that right now. Um, it, was, it was a very strange process. Laborers who must have been freezing cold were sawing the ice into blocks. Blocks were popped up on top of a kind of a surface. They were brought to an ice house. They were wrapped in straw and paper. And basically the game was to try and stop the ice from melting. Um, these ice houses were specially designed then to hold, you know, 150 tons of ice, blocking the ice, you know, together and um, prying it loose when you wanted to take it out. So, you know, we had a very developed system for this ice um, stuff. Um, and obviously, most of the ice melted on the journey, right? But obviously, because you're shipping ice, um, not in a fridge. Um, it took months of travel, and there was a lot of people um, in competition to bring the ice from the, the Arctic Lake to your, um, to your dinner party. Um, and then I asked in my talks, do you recognize this man? Nobody does. A few people might. No, nobody does. Nobody does. Fred, Fred Ferdinand Carey, he invented the refrigerator, painted it in 1860, and fitted on ships in 1876. So you look at the buildup of ice and how much of it was shipped. Um, and basically what happened was it kept increasing. And then at one point in time, there's a discontinuous innovation. That means something happened, like when the, the horse becomes the car, it's just totally different. It's not a better horse. And so you see then at that point that the numbers will tail off. Um, and this is where the story becomes um, allegorical back to product management. Um, if you go back to the early 2000s, you will see and I worked in teams like this, that um, there was a marketing team and a separate software development team. And the marketing team would go off and talk to customers. And then they would come back and say, yeah, they want this, they want that. And the, the software team would go and build it. The engineering team would build it, give it back to the marketing team. They would give it back to the client. The client would go, yeah, but it doesn't work. Yeah, you did build a feature. You did, but it's, it's not done well. This doesn't work for me because of some reason. So this separation between uh, marketing and software, marketing and engineering didn't work, totally wasted. If you look at the, the number of software projects that were successful, you get a similar wastefulness score to the ice melting. Um, 
And this is because of the, the, the discontinuous innovation. This is because the internet brought a new set of tools and new set of channels and facilitated new practices. Um, around 2001, we see that this kind of um, project approach became more agile. And some people, some very famous people, if you're an agile nerd like me, uh, wrote an, a manifesto that said, we value the stuff on the left here more than the stuff on the right. We responding to change is better than following a plan. Co collaborating with the customer is better than negotiating contracts. Something that works is way better than huge documentation. And people and how they interact is way better than any sort of process or tools. Um, and there became this way, this new way of building software called Agile using some methods like Scrum, um, extreme programming, um, since then Kanban, that basically took this massive frontal planning approach away and put teams together where one of the people on the team would be kind of marketer and engineering manager rolled into one, but not really because they're a part of the team. And this was called the product owner. And this kind of brought the whole product management stuff to the fore in the mid 2000s. Um, Eric Ries wrote a book called um, uh, Lean, Lean something, because I'm kind of mind blank now, but basically talking about lean, start, lean Startup. Lean Startup, and he had this way of iterating through a, a process that, that culminated with the learn step that then went back into iter iteration two, learning again, iteration three. And um, this whole context, you know, this, this, this idea of the, the internet being a discontinuous innovation, this idea of agile having a product owner, lean principles, new tools, became a discipline called product management and basically empowered this person with being a member of a team that was building something that would take responsibility for talking directly to customers, understanding their needs, being technically proficient uh, and making loads of those little decisions as you go. Um, and just in case you're wondering, what was this dude doing talking about ice for so long? The two stories are allegorical in the sense that there was huge waste, there was high demand, and there was a better solution that came with a discontinuous innovation. Now, I haven't yet talked about how you actually get into being a product manager. And the answer to that is that um, most people were something else. They were either project manager and business analyst. Those are the two most common ones. Um, and a business analyst, by the way, is someone who maybe would look at what does a system need to do? And in the old days, you would read requirements that would read like this, 1.2, the system shall, 1.3, the system shall, 1.4, that's fine. But these days we tend to talk about people more so and context more. So we tend to say when X happens, person A wants to do something or wants to see something. But um, a business analyst has got good technical proficiency skills and probably needs to you know, level up when it comes to working with teams, setting targets, um, managing metrics, um, defining goals. A project manager, probably good at those things, but maybe is often kind of less technically strong. And again, that depends on the product manager, but um, they, they're often all over the, let's keep everything moving, let's know the people, let's know what the risks are, but might not be into, well, if I haven't optimized this for mobile, then 27% of my customers won't be able to use it effectively, right? So a marketing people are also really good product managers. Again, they will tend to be really good at that marketing side. And again, sometimes less strong on the technical side. Architects, very strong technically, might be people who uh, need some more experience with managing teams um, and and uh, customer success, customer support, huge uh, amount of uh, product managers come from being support people. Of course, because they know the product well, they're used to talking to customers, they see what's gone wrong, they know it intimately as a product, and basically they just become product people over time. Um, and that is the crux of how you, how you probably move into product management. Um, there are other ways of getting into product management, which would be uh, finding companies where you can basically do three or six months as an intern 
Um, one thing you should know is that product managers tend, product managers tend to be very much um, outcome focused. So if you say to them, here's an Excel file with a thousand rows, you need to go through each one and fix something, and then the team will, will deliver its thing on time, they'll do it. They're not above dirty tasks. Um, they will do whatever it takes, testing, uh, programming, anything, anything that they're able to do to move the team forward. Um, so if you were to find uh, lucky enough to find a place that said, hey, we'll give you a three or six month internship into product, um, yeah, expect to do some dirty work, but it'll be, it'll be for the greater good. Uh, the other thing that I haven't got on the slides, but is definitely something that I see as being um, effective is to build your own product. Okay, this is a this is a tremendous way to bridge yourself into starting as a product manager. So, for example, if you've got an existing um, product as an entrepreneur that you've built, um, can you learn more about it? For example, can you um, can you, for example, at a very starting point, you might think of okay, well, I've just got a WordPress website. Right, very simple website. It's just WordPress. But within that, you could see yourself uh, A/B testing using Google Optimize. Again, you don't need any technical skills really for that. Um, you could install. Um, you could improve the SEO on that site. Again, very valuable, very technical thing to do. You could potentially plug in some Google ads or Facebook ads. Again, good skill to have. Um, you could set conversion goals. Um, hook up some metrics tools, and even on a very small website of your own that maybe just has blogs and videos and some, some other content, you could effectively be a little mini product manager. That would be a great start for you to then move into a role, for example, at a company called like Loungy or another you know, more established startup or even 100 person company or 10,000 people company that you at least have shown the proficiency that you have worked on some projects in a product type of role. Um, now, you might just think as well about why you're there. I mean, the product owner, um, product owner, product manager, I think of them as the same thing. A lot of bigger companies don't. The product owner is very junior and, and in a certain team, just helping to keep that team moving. And the product manager has got a wider vision. I use the terms interchangeably and always have. Um, Roman Pitchner says the product owner has two main responsibilities, creating and delivering the vision. Um, that is true. You may find that if you get a job at, as a product manager, there is already a vision and that's fine. You just need to make sure one exists. Um, and generally you'll find that most people working on any sort of project, there is a vision there. It just needs to be clarified. You need to build consensus on it. You need to talk about it so everyone's clear about it. Um, and Ken, Ken Schwaber says one person responsible for the ROI of the product, which is also true. Um, what that person is responsible for the, pro the, the product's success. Um, I spoke a little bit about this earlier, but I do want to talk about it some more. Um, a good product manager has a vision, gets his hands dirty, I said, is an open and honest communicator, meaning that if you're not for real, you know, you will, you will get found out. Um, a brilliant negotiator encourages consensus. Um, being likable helps. If you're if you're a real nasty piece of work, people are just not going to do anything for you. Um, you need to understand the domain. So if it's pet insurance, you need to know a lot about insurance and pets to be to be effective. And you need to be passionate and committed. Um, so think about this in terms of curiosity traits. Are you generally uh, passionate, curious, uh, people loving? Um, do you enjoy communication? Do you enjoy resolving conflicts? If you just can't do conflict at all, product might not be the place for you. Um, and do you have this kind of um, care of duty to the end user of your product that, that you will put them first? Um, bigger companies um, tend to be siloed, sales, marketing, engineering, finance. A product manager straddles all of those. So if you wanna work with a bigger company, um, you will need to know all of the key people in all of these organizations. They will come to you and ask for stuff and you will say no most of the time and they will still like you afterwards. That's the goal. Sounds hard. It is hard. You get better at it. And um, 
that's better than before. Like I said, it works in teams where you know engineering is separate from marketing. Um, it's not great. So the product manager will seek to um, bring the organization together, um, will add value, and will basically explain to everyone who's asking for things and not getting them why this is, what it is we are doing, why that is priority, what does value mean, and maybe I can't give you what you asked for, but I can do something for you so that we preserve the relationship. Um, and when you've got product management working like that, um, the company is better than before. So look, um, I think this talk would have helped you realize that there isn't a degree in product management, although there, there, there actually is. I taught a degree in product management at Open Classroom um, and it's still there, but it was the first of its kind. And if you go to most universities, you won't find a degree in product management. So what I say is kind of generally true. So how are you going to get into it? Well, you're going to have to do it just by practicing, um, either on a side of yours, either by um, getting an internship somewhere, or by getting into one of those roles that we mentioned earlier, whether it be project management, business analysis, customer support, et cetera, marketing. Um, evangelizing product management, you know, being someone who goes to product management talks or consumes content, reads all the books on the topic that they can find. Networking, you know, if you know other product managers, reach out to them. You know, I've seen people go from not product managers to product managers. Um, it happens all the time, but you need to be open to opportunities and you need to be someone who's gonna find out about things if they open up, which is all, which is all about networking, which is all about the Lounge platform. And indeed this Digi Nomads network. Post things here, post product questions. Uh, and you have to enjoy it um, because it is really hard. Everyone comes to you with all their problems, solve this for me. And the reason that you love it is because the energy is high and because um, you are ultimately at everyone's service. So um, think about how to get into those kind of uh, roles and how to build up your practice and how to, to be more surrounded by product people. Um, that's it. I'll finish now because I know people are probably going to have a few questions. It'd be nice to, to spend a few minutes um, if that's the case. And thanks very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I think I, I have a couple of questions. So first is that, do you have any book that you would recommend to uh, to the attendees and to all of the the uh, those who wants to learn about product management? Yeah, the book that everyone references is by Marty Kagan called Inspired. Um, I don't think it's the best product book, but it's a very good intro to product management. So the book Inspired is a good one to get. Um, then um, there's a few others I'll just throw out there. Um, if you're actually getting started in the job, the, the book I always give my product guys early um, is one that's called um, Bridging the Communication Gap by Goiko Adzic. Bridging the Communication Gap is an excellent book for some of the technical things you need to do. Um, I also um, like a book about finding out what customers really want, which is called When Cabbage and Kale Compete, which is a really good book um, that I also advise everyone to get. The Lean Startup book is very good by Eric Ries. Um, yeah, and um, what else is good? Um, yeah, I mean, if you just Google best product books, you'll get uh, you'll get a whole host of them. But those are some of my favorites. Oh, and the Mom's mom test. test. The mom test. Uh, yes. So the mom test is about the, the the fallacy of asking people, "What do you want?" and just taking their answers as gospel. Um, you need to use a more nuanced approach to find out when people are being polite to you versus giving you usable information. So that's a very short, uh, very lovely, very valuable book. Is it not, Giacomo? Yes, it is. I think yes, I read it, it three times. <laughs> it's very yeah. short, super useful. I would say extremely useful uh, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, everyone uh, should read it, AJT. That's what really. I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Paul. Uh, do you have thoughts on re working remote as a product manager? Can you do that or do you need to be present physically close to the, the team? How do you see things? Well, I work remotely. 
So it's definitely possible. Um, I would say that there's a lot to be said for being in the same room as people. And there are times when I'm working remotely with people that I know if we could all just be in the same room for a day, we could solve something. And it might take, you know, a few days because we're remote, we're asynchronous, we're in different time zones. Um, but it's definitely possible. Um, what we have done typically in Loungey previously is we've had a dev team working remotely. And once every three months, we get together for a week um, to, to just do, have fun, drink beers, go surfing, spend half our time working. And that worked really well because it keeps the relationships between all the team members strong. Um, but I've also had people who haven't I've worked remotely with and haven't met them for a year. You know, I just, I just never met them in person. The one thing that you need to be aware of, I think, in this, um, in this world is that you are going to get more sensory information when you're in the room with people every single day. If we all go to the same office every day and I'm feeling a bit low or down or just not happy, you can tell from my facial expressions and um, it's easier in some ways because you just go over to the team, sit on their desks and lots of chat happens. So I would say the, the, it might be more challenging to do it remotely if you're a first time product manager, but it is possible. And all, all I would say is if you're going to do remote product management or remote anything, then it's a really good idea that you check in emotionally with the team. Um, there's been plenty of times when I knew the most important thing to work on. And some of the, some of the, some of the members of the team are like, yeah, I mean, I'd like to do this first. And I let them do that first, even though I don't care about that thing. But, you know, everyone needs to have a sense of autonomy. Everyone needs to feel like they get a choice in what they work on. That doesn't mean they can do, do what you want, whenever you want. It just means that there's give and take. Um, and so you just need to have a certain set of skills that complement that. And you just need to make sure that um, if you're working remotely as a product manager, that um, you spend some time on every call being good energy, um, being talking about stuff that isn't work, because you never see each other. Um, referencing people, like, you know, if one of the people in the team just did a marathon or, or you can have a laugh together, that's really important. And that relationship, um, those relationships will be intact. Hopefully people will trust you. If that's done, if that's something you've got, then the working remotely is, is fine. But it's, uh, it, you know, it's not easy to, remain, to maintain relationships remotely. But it's definitely doable. And look, the thing is that people want to work remotely these days. Um, I want to work remotely. I won't take a job. Well, I, I don't, I'm not looking for a job, but I wouldn't take a job in an office where I have to be in that office every day anymore. And I think a lot of people are the same since COVID. So the question is not so much, can it be done, as how might you do it? And I think that as long as you give at least as much um, importance to how well you're getting on with everyone to as much as you're getting done, then you'll be fine. Brilliant. Uh, last uh, question uh, from Alex. Would you recommend to work at a startup or at a more established company first? Well, it's a bit late for you, Alex, but um, who's also a product at Lounge, by the way. But um, they're very different. And um, for example, I was working in Yahoo for, I think, four years. Um, there were things that were great. So there was a reporting team. There was an email team. There was, um, there was kind of a sign-on authentication platform. So we, get, we had all of this. We didn't have to build it. It was great. Amazing. Um, but when you need stuff from another team, they're going to be like, no, you can't have it. I mean, the answer is not always no, but you know they've got their roadmap and you often find yourself constrained by that. Um, but there, there are skills that are really good with being in a larger company. If you work on, um, if you work for Amazon, for example, 
you might be given one step of a sign up flow and that's your whole job right that's that's you that's it you don't work on anything else yeah sure amazon might have a new car coming out it's got nothing to do with you buddy <laughs> so you know you, and let's just say you've got a job as salesforce tomorrow well it's a very established product um so it's unlikely that in salesforce you would be coming up with a totally new product of salesforce what's most likely is you've got established customers and they want their reports to have a new type of filter in it so it's very detailed whereas contrast that with being in a startup where literally you will do everything you will be involved in marketing you will be involved in support you will be involved in uh, probably some design choices you'll be involved in um the products the product specifications new features metrics uh, everything so um, if you were to start off and have a year or two at a startup, I think you would be a more rounded uh, product manager. You would have experienced it all. Um, if you work in a bigger company, you probably have far less breadth of experience. But um, again, if you worked two, three years at Salesforce, you might find it easier to get a job. You're like, oh, you worked at Salesforce. That's impressive. <laughs> um, and you probably also have a few skills that you wouldn't get at a startup, like navigating very large organizations and so on. But because it was a straight question, I'll say startup as a straight answer, if you had the choice. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Just very last before we move into Paul talk, um, Maria is asking when they're looking for candidates or product managers, are they looking more around uh, looking at your degree or more the experience? I guess you answered probably. Yeah, I, but then I, I probably answered that one already. But I, I mean, definitely experience because, um, but uh, like having my dad once said to me, you know why, you know why uh, you do a degree? I was like, why? And he goes, because you say to an employer, we can give you something very, very hard and very, very complicated and you'll be able to do it. So n I would never downplay having a degree or a master's. It's, it's always going to stand you in good stead. Um, but product people are very practical. And if you are coming to me with no degree and you're like, yeah, but look, here's my own website and all the stuff I've implemented on it, Google ads, Facebook ads, SEO. These are my things that I've done. I drive traffic this way. And then I've AB tested this and I, that, if you can show me that, um, that's worth more than a degree in literature because, you know, you're showing me a lot of the personality traits. That's, ba that's basically what I think you need to know. If someone's hiring you as a product manager, they're looking for personality traits because the rest, you know, they're going to have to teach you anyway or show you anyway, or you have to learn it anyway. Every product is so different. Loungy is so different to Salesforce, right? Um, which is so different to, to TikTok, right? The, the products are very different. So if you are, if I'm hiring a product person tomorrow, they need to be curious passionate, empathic, um, detail-oriented, um, communi good communicator, all these things we talked about, those are the most important things. So, um, and also, this kind of bonus point here, do stuff that not everybody else is willing to do. Like, if you wanted to come for a job for Loungy and you had studied Loungy, don't turn up to the interview without having logged in and, and signed up for the product. That's just wasting everyone's time. Why should I give you a job as a product manager? You haven't even tried the product. Like, so that's number one. Number two, try it on all devices. Number three, sign up for the emails. Look at our marketing. Look at our web page. Look, Google us. What are people complaining about? And you can say, well, listen, people seem to be complaining about this feature. I would change it this way. Automatically, you stand out as someone who is a self-starter, is um, can be independent, um, isn't just going to sit there waiting for instructions but we'll have to get up and go. So personality traits, personality traits, personality traits. And that's why I always recommend like, you know, have your own website and, uh, and show me what you've done. But the Great. last thing, sorry, the, I will add one last thing. There are not enough product managers, right? So when there's not enough product managers, the hiring these days, it doesn't, it's not like what well, you have to have five years experience or, or you don't get in. It's just, just, there's not enough. So somebody who is talented, 
who has the right personality type, who interviews well, who has done the research and has got some experience that they've got from their own WordPress site or something, uh, automatically you're at the top of the pile. And so feel, uh, feel brave and go for it.